How's it going? Hey. Good. How are you? Great. How are you? Doing well. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you. I all see right. you got you got IT there, Dill? Yeah, I got IT there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. Right on, guys. Uh so uh are you guys both from you're from Jersey, right? You go yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean I I, I am. Uh, you're from Jersey. I, yeah. I grew up on Long Island, but I uh, I adopted Jersey pretty soon or like right around the end of high school. So Okay. Yeah, I've been I've been in Jersey for a long time now. What about you, Dylan? You were born and raised there? Yeah, yeah, actually in like uh, you know, northwest uh New Jersey, which is more like um you know, Pennsylvania or or upstate New York than it is like uh, you know, Sopranoville. Um so yeah. Yes. Okay, cool, cool. How'd you get into music originally? Did were your parents uh musicians at all? Yeah, so my dad is uh he didn't he didn't, you know, make a living, a formal living at it, but uh mm-hmm. he was um always played around the house. He's a guitar player and sort of plays guitar like I do. Uh, sort of just doesn't have the, the, um, he, he's more of a strummer, you know what I mean? Uh, more mm-hmm. of a guy who just kind of fumbles around with the chords. And, uh, so yeah, I always grew up with a guitar in the house and, uh, probably around 12, I, you know, asked him to teach me how to play. Okay. And that didn't really consist of, of a major lesson. He just kind of gave me a couple of chords a week. And said, uh, you know, what, when you can play these chords together, I'll give you two more. And oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's how he did his lessons. You know, that's how he said he learned in the Navy. So that's how he taught me. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so he didn't, he would teach you two, not three chords at a time. Because then if you two. could play, Only if you had two. three, you could do a song. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> uh, well, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So you picked up guitar. Um, what about you, Jeff? How, what was the? How did you get introduced into music? Uh, the the beginning of my story is similar um, with regard to my dad having a guitar, always having one around. Mm-hmm. Um, though though mine was more like uh, around the same age, around twelve. I was I started sneaking it, and there was no there was no lessons to be had there, like from <laughs> from my old man. It was. Uh, uh, it was more of a subversive act of like sneaking into his closet and grabbing it because he wasn't doing anything good with it. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, I taught myself with like Arlen Roth books and Van Halen records pretty okay. much. Okay, cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And did you guys start bands in elementary school? I mean, like middle school, high school? Or, or like what was the first band experience you guys had? You want to go do yeah, so I, I started a band with my buddies um, who I actually did the first Milwaukee's record with when we, oh. were, when we were like in uh, uh, sixth grade going into seventh grade. Um, wow. So you guys were all these, that was the Milwaukee's back then? Sixth yeah, and well, grade? <laughs> the, the band name was Love Pond back then. Got uh, it. We had another singer um, uh, who's still our good friend. Um, and, uh, he uh you know he was the most uh he was like the best looking most uh alternative kid in school back in the early 90s which this was a big deal you know (laughs) (laughs) so i did not want to be the singer um i kind of wanted to be the songwriter uh which i you know started doing um Mm -hmm. and he would write the lyrics i i couldn't be bothered with the lyrics but I, I wanted to construct songs and uh, I wanted to uh, construct melodies and, and chord changes or something that kind of came easy to me pretty early on. But yeah, we, we, um, so we played, you know, not too many gigs, but we played gigs throughout, you know, high school and stuff here, there, we played parties. Uh, we played my wife's uh, sweet 16 party, which was our first gig. Really? Uh, That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we were really nervous, but um, yeah, you know, we played some covers, some originals, and uh, but that's it. I had a band since I was twelve, and uh, geez, I still do, and I, I, I can't believe I, I still have a band, you know, at this point. But yeah, it's something <laughs> that I've always done. It's like <laughs> I don't know. It's like eating bagels in, in Jersey or something. Like for me, it's just something that I've done. Yeah. 
That's cool. Yeah. What, what about you, Jeff? Did you start uh, any bands in high school or any? I uh, cool? I didn't start. I didn't have the nerve to start a band in high school. I would I, we would play in a buddy's attic. I, we'd play like Sympathy for the Devil for seven hours, and I could just <laughs> solo an E over that all day. And that was like I just like that. That was like the greatest thing in the world. But I didn't. I don't know. I was sort of. Um, I was coming from a place and maybe I was raised in a way that like, that seemed like that's for, that's for other people. Like that's for, it's not for us. We're like, mm -hmm. we're, you know, like it's nothing special or whatever happened in here. Like that's over there. And um, it wasn't until I got to, I went to college in uh, at Rutgers in, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, which mm -hmm. um, has had moments of being a real hotbed of, of bands and music and stuff. Um, sure, yeah. And so when I showed up in New Brunswick, suddenly I saw all these guys who were just like me, and the only difference was that they just had nerve. And that was sort of, I'd been playing, you know, either just uh, as as a hobby with with buddies in a in a in an attic, or I'd been playing just alone in the basement to like like for hours, you know. But mm -hmm. but. Uh, it was sort of seeing guys and realizing that like, that's not over there. Like, <laughs> like, the, like I could, I can do that too. And yeah, there's a lot it's of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that really changed me. And, and I like instantly had to have a band. I'm like, well, shit, if they're doing it, I can, I can do that. Like I, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So a uh, couple things through, through, through college in the early nineties uh, before hooking up with Dylan and, and sort of locking in here. Cool. So yeah, so tell me about how did you meet Dylan? How did you meet the rest of the guys in the band? Like how did how did you guys really form? Because you were talking earlier, Dylan, you said that the Milwaukee's kind of started in sixth grade or whatever. Yeah. Like did you have different members like throughout the course of the years? Yeah, so basically a very short timeline is that it was uh me and my two other buddies who were the rhythm section, and it was mm -hmm. me and then we had a singer. And then we sort of like we went off to college and I kind of took over on vocals. I was writing the songs at, at that point. I became more comfortable with writing lyrics and, and doing that whole thing. So, um, so that was that. And then um, uh, the drummer and I, who's a, still a great friend of ours, who still plays gigs with us once in a while. And, and uh, we'll still come over, you know, my house with his kids and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, um me and him, you know, we were friends since we were five years old. We had a, you know, a falling out over the band, which was, you know, in hindsight, pretty silly. But um, at that point, I we had gotten uh, Brian Store to join the band, uh, and, and uh, Brian was great, and uh, he was playing in a bunch of bands around town. And Brian had gone to college. He he was from Minnesota, um, and uh, he. Uh, he was going to college in New Brunswick and he was the one who knew Jeff and knew everybody from that scene. I, I, I didn't really know anything about the Rucker scene. Um, although we played there in the late nineties. And so that's how, uh, the bridge between Brian and, and, uh, we were looking for a second guitar player and Brian said, uh, well, I think, you know, I, I know the guy and we called Jeff up and Jeff came in and, um, you know, rehearsed with us, I, I guess a couple times. And, um, I'm still waiting for them to invite me to join the band, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's only been 20 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I, I, uh, uh, I definitely got in through, through Brian. When, when we write, like, the official history of the, the Milwaukee's, we, we sort of start the, like, adult version of the Milwaukee's with the release of Missile Command, right, right around early 2000 kind of the it was it was recorded in 99 but released in 2000 and basically i joined right before it was released because it was sort of like a big sounding record and i think mm -hmm. they were kind of getting serious and figuring out how we're, they were going to do that and uh i was a big fan of this guy brian because he was one of these new brunswick guys that i would just follow around and i had played it in, in sort of a one-off band with him once before and i Actually, before that, I had, I had run sound for the, the sort of the three piece kind of like late adolescent Milwaukee's. And I was like, oh, that's kind of, I don't know, this is an interesting band. I'll keep my eye on them. And then, and then I heard that my, my buddy Brian had joined and I went to see them at Maxwell's in Hoboken. 
with Brian, maybe one of his first shows. And uh, after they got off stage, I was like, Brian, I, like, I know all of the second guitar parts already. Like, I don't even know, I don't know if you're looking for another guitar player, but I like, I know exactly how to play on these songs. Mm-hmm. And so he introduced me to Dylan. And wow. Like, yeah. And then you guys, and then yeah, it all kind of came together for you. And, and so you joined the band. Later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you, you joined the band right when you, right when you put out uh, Missile Command. Yeah. So tell me yeah. about writing and recording that that record, Dylan, and then we can get into the the next part of the album. Um, uh, yeah. So um, yeah, my memory of that, and again, this is twenty years I ago. Wrote, <laughs> yeah, I mean, at, least, at least, and I probably wrote those songs twenty two years ago. Wow. Uh, um, my memory of that was that um, um, I've been trying to over the years come up with uh, words to describe that, and I think a lot of people have. Uh, that write songs, uh, but it just very easy and very uh, free flowing and not much thought. You know, the best parts of songwriting, as I can really pin them down, are, are just no real thought went into it. It was all just something that we were just so excited. I was so excited to do. Songs were coming fast, um, very prolific back then. I could write songs in my sleep. I mean, it's all I thought about. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that was very easy. The songs kind of came kind of quick. And then our producer, um, who we worked with on a couple other albums, Wayne Durrell, um, he really refined for the first time. I, I had someone tell me, um, Hey, I really like this song, but you know, the chorus needs help Mm -hmm. or, you know, you don't have a message in this song or, or, or the bridge or something isn't working, you know, and that challenged me to, um, to work harder. Wayne was the first guy who ever like really pushed me. Now, before mm-hmm. then, everybody would always tell me, uh, oh, the song's great. The song is great. And, uh, that's the last thing I personally need. <laughs> um, I need kind of somebody to tell me that it needs more work or, or, or you need to really, you know, you, you could have something here. You just need to work on it. So, mm-hmm. uh, that's what Wayne did for me and for the band in that in that setting and i just think we were just guys who started a band when we were 12 and uh you know we were about 21 when we were recording it mm-hmm. and uh i think that was the just culmination of all those years of rehearsal and all the hard work we put in and all that and uh those were the songs at that time and uh i'm still proud of that record because we were young you know mm-hmm. I, it's amazing to me being an older guy now looking back and um, as, as most artists are when they look back on their younger years uh, Mm -hmm. that, uh, that it's still to me sonically and, and, and the songs still hold up. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud of that. That's cool. That's really cool. Do you guys still play some of the songs off that record? For sure. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. People want to hear them. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So then you joined the band, uh, Jeff, and then what was from there? What did you guys do with Missile Command? Was that out on a label, or did you put that out independently? Did you guys tour uh, on it? It? It, was on a, it was on a little indie label. Um, it was actually technically co-released. Um, it was a guy named Brendan uh, Whalen who was kind of managing the band, really, who was, I mean, one of the, the patron saints of the band early on. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wanted to release it but he didn't really have he he had a lot of in enthusiasm and passion um but he didn't have like dollars and in infrastructure <laughs> so he, he he co-released it with uh not a huge label but a, another sort of better funded better connected indie in new jersey called childlike records um and uh you know what <laughs> what was sort of odd and interesting about what ended up happening over the year that sort of followed then was they, you know, they did a great job, like getting it out to radio a little bit and sending it around for some reviews and stuff. Um, but we were, we wanted to get out. We wanted to, to get out of New Jersey. We not, and just go and play different places at one of the, I mean, I, I loved coming out of, this scene in New Brunswick, which was a very like fertile creative place, but it was also totally like incestuous. And one of the things Mm -hmm. that, that I brought to the band was I just watched a whole bunch of 
bands that I love kind of wither and die because they only played one town or one area. And like, you never learn to get great at your songs and your craft when it's always the same people, you know, like you, you, you don't hone, you just, it's creative and it's fun, but it's not like, it's, it's not, it's a different thing. And they all just burned out. Mm -hmm. So when I joined, I kind of brought the thing of like, let's get out, like, let's get to other places. Let's get in front of people and have to play this to total strangers and let's figure it out and let's go. And, uh, there wasn't a lot of that thinking or support coming from the the label then, but oddly, we um, we hooked up th through Brendan, who uh, used to work as like I guess he was like sort of like a, a roadie or just an extra set of hands for the band Kid with Manhead, um, who was sort of like I don't know minor punk pop like legends back in the day. He had connections. He he met up with a guy from Canada from when they toured in Canada who wanted to put out, he's like, do you have anything else? You want to put out an EP? Can I get you to come and tour in Canada? And um, so we kind of hustled in and did an EP that called the, the Bland Comfort of Life with Lloyd Justin, which I think is, is <laughs> it's a very fascinating document of how excited we were. If you listen to like <laughs> all the tempos on it are like all like through the roof and like get faster as we go. But we were like, we were, you know, early twenties and, and just full of, full of steam mm -hmm. and the music sounds like it. And that, that EP, like the guy in Canada had no like money or resources to put it out, but he just is like, yeah, just come. I'll, I'll, I'll print some CDs, but guys just, just come here and I can hook you up with shows. We're like, yes, that's what we want. So that's yeah. when we sort of transitioned into being a touring band and, and this, Glenn helped us sort of with our first tour across Canada. And then we got bitten by like getting out and playing, playing shows elsewhere. Um, <laughs> yeah, and we're from really there, band. what's that? I said, we're really a Canadian band. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So the first place you really toured was Canada. You guys would just went yeah, to Canada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> yeah. All we ended up, we ended up banned for life from Canada, sort of, um, at one point. But really, I want to hear that story. We saw the Sudbury <laughs> nickel, but <laughs> yeah, we, we the world's largest nickel. We saw that. Yeah, yeah. we drove around it. Um, <laughs> but uh, to finish the story, there is like like from that point on, we sort of turned into like a self-directed machine because what we knew what we wanted to do was just do anything we could to play as many shows in as many places as possible. Mm -hmm. And that was that <laughs> for better or for worse, the only way we could find to do that was to do it ourselves. Um, I'm not sure that we looked too hard. We were never super good at like, courting industry people or you know um shopping ourselves to people who could help so we didn't get any help and we just did it ourselves for many years mm -hmm. touring and going and and we ended up in europe a couple times um back and forth across the u.s a lot of up and down the east coast um just kind of on our own muscle wow yeah that's that's really cool wow yeah well, tell me the name, the bland comfort of life with Lloyd Justin. I like that is the longest title. And what is that? Who's Lloyd Justin? <laughs> so, and we were recording the record. Um, we recorded it in this uh, 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 studio called the Pigeon Club in uh, in Hoboken. It was an old uh, homing pigeon club. That was some. That was legit Sopranos. Legit, legit. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's that's and that's yeah. Yeah. So all the wise guys hung out in front. They played, you know, pinochle, and they, you know, ran pigeons uh, off the roof. Yeah, off the roof. And then in the back was a recording studio, and that's where we <laughs> recorded our first. I mean, uh, we recorded four out of our six records there. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, and so. Uh, one of the things was they had these old readers digests in the, in the front, the old school hardcover readers digests. And mm -hmm. I was looking through one of them and, uh, one of them was the, the cover, uh, the cover of the EP. Um, if you look it up, it's a, a good looking woman. She's, I don't know, in the sixties and she's sitting on a hot muscle car 
And yeah. underneath the caption, it just said the bland comfort of life with Lloyd Justin. And <laughs> to the guys, I mean, this is as good as a, of a title for an EP as anything. So that's what we did. And then we put the rest of the pictures in that little story about her and yeah. her husband, uh, or she had an affair with this guy named Lottie. Uh, yeah. and, 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 the and then there was Lottie. You know? Yeah. Uh, 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 oh man. She was she was into Italian men. <laughs> That's awesome. You know the whole backstory too. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, again, I read this. Justin. Yeah, I read the story years ago. I mean, she she uh, what I know is that she was not into Lloyd Justin, her husband. Yeah. It was it was a bland comfort of life. And uh, <laughs> and I would love to say the songs connected to that theme, but they absolutely did not. Yeah, nothing uh, there was zero thought put into any of this. Like, <laughs> like many, many True. bands and many, uh, many people who write songs. There's like zero thought that gets put into it, and then year, years later, people start telling you uh, what, what all these things mean. And and I'll take any, I'll take any of it. Yeah, we did. You remember, we did um, try to audition a guy for bass that we met at a show in Maryland. A yeah. young guy. Remember, we met a guy named Justin Lloyd. Justin Lloyd. <laughs> um years like probably two or three years after recording the ep and uh he was a good musician and we tried to get him to move to new jersey when we were in in, in uh in search of a bass player he mm-hmm. did not nibble it, though it would have been excellent to have justin lloyd in in the band yeah <laughs> <laughs> come full circle there that'd be awesome yeah um so with that with the ep did you get you did more touring or when did you start really going like across the country and stuff you you said you guys did that canada tour yeah i mean yeah. from 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 canada from that canada tour for the next i don't know four ish years four or five years we were on the road a lot uh the canada hookup ended up with a licensing the, the canadian label started licensing things to a label called boss tunage in the uk um which started uh, it was cool. They they put us. They just put one of the songs actually off of Missile Command on on a compilation. They had some weird like they would <laughs> the good old days when you had to like send merchandise or send you know move units. Um, mm-hmm. the, uh, the Canadian label would just send a box, uh, an assorted box of discs over to the UK label, and the UK label would just burn a track off of each of those discs and put it on a a free comp that they just send to their whole mailing list. Oh, sure. I remember and people getting would, free people would then it, it would come with the catalog and you'd be able to order the full disc off of that, like mm. the like little order form. Um, and he got from that comp, a lot of people really dug drink Soviet champagne, which was the first track on missile command. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, the guy in the UK is like, I don't He's like, he wanted to know if he could deal direct with us. Like, could he do something? So the next record, which is, this is a stick up, um, was actually only sort of properly released by labels in the UK and in Canada. And we self-released it in the U S. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, basically from, you know, the, 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 the tail end of missile command through the Lloyd Justin stuff all the way through, um, run up to the release of and supporting this is a stick up we were we were all over the place for about five years there wow yeah. so from from that uh the european label did, is that who got you out to play those shows out in europe and stuff for the first yeah. time yeah tell me about yeah. that did they just set up the whole tour for you did, yeah. were you like supporting somebody no, we were headlining. <laughs> wow. Uh, one, one of the weird things about this band is that, uh, I don't know if this is going to sound like overly arrogant or what, but people hear our records and they're just, they just think we should be headlining things. And they don't like, <laughs> they don't do the math on the, on like, or like the market research on the draw necessarily. <laughs> and and it's, it's a real, it's a real roll of the dice for them because like sometimes it works. Sometimes, sometimes, you know, in, Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada, or like, you know, Cambridge in, in the UK, like, we'll pack a room because like, people like word gets out, and they're coming all this way, you got to check out this record you've never heard. And like, people react, respond, and, and sometimes we'll pack a room like that. And then sometimes we don't. <laughs> so so the Europe, the Europe shows were like very hit or miss. It was like one town to the next. It sort of 
depended on who the promoter was and how well that promoter tapped the vein of the scene in that area. You know, like we got, sure. we got hammered in, in like, I don't know, a, a show or two in, in like Germany or whatever, but we had a, I, really, a couple really good shows in the UK. I, my, my favorite one ever was, uh, you mentioned Germany. Um, <laughs> I remember playing, I don't know what town it was cause I never remember. Um, but we were playing a show in Germany and the guy is lying to us. Or maybe it was a Jeff. I don't know if it, I don't know. <laughs> My memory gets foggy. Um, but he says, uh, where are all the people? <laughs> <laughs> because he came to the show expecting to see like yeah. literally, you know, he was spec at that point. It was like, he thought it was like, okay, well, I'm going to go see this band because Kings of Leon is not coming in for another two weeks. So I'm going to go see these guys and I'll see Kings of Leon next. Uh, but it'll be the same kind of show. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was about 20 people there and he was just, he wanted to know where all the people were. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it was great. Yeah. Was that the first time you guys had ever been, I mean, personally to Europe and stuff? Or had you yeah. been before? Yes, for me. Yeah, no, I had been a, I had been a bunch just because, um, we, uh, I, well, my father, uh, insisted, uh, not that we cared, but, uh, I have, I had two other brothers and, um, my, uh, father and sister, we have an exchange student from Italy, uh, uh okay. and, we, and, and we did every summer. And mm -hmm. so when we were in high school, um, and uh, we all got along really well. And so we used to go to Italy all, all, all the time just because his parents wanted to return the favor. Sure. And uh, I, I fancied myself a soccer player when I was young. So mm -hmm. I used to go there and play soccer with all the Italians in these little, you know, sort of like cages and <laughs> drink wine. It was fantastic in these little <laughs> Italian towns. So that was my experience with Europe. I'd never been to like Germany or anywhere else, but I'd been to Italy probably three or four times. I, I, when did you ever have to sleep uh, on the like uh, on the second no. floor above? In a, a, I was in never a, in an sta abandoned stage um, with no. with no windows and no sleeping bags and, and uh, t shirts wrapped around your head, cuddling I with never, your bandmates. I, I never <laughs> slept in Stoke. <laughs> I was in a beautiful little. I was in a beautiful little <laughs> village called. Polignano Amare in uh, in Italy, which is right <laughs> on the coast, and it was it was beautiful, yeah. and the women were beautiful, and the wine was beautiful, and uh, it, I had a lot of lovely memories so, there. So it's <laughs> opposite of what touring with the Milwaukee's is. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't sleep in the in, on a on a on a foam cushion at the at the Rapid Hockey Club. Um, no, I did not. <laughs> was that pretty cool going out? There? I mean, it's crazy to me that you guys. Like the first tour you did was Canada. Like yeah. you're, I'm yeah. going to go to a different country. And then you go, and then you guys were able to tour Europe. Yeah. Tell me about that. Was like being in a country you'd never been to, like being, well, how'd you guys get around? Like that, that whole thing just seems like so, it's pretty terrifying to me. I don't know. Personally. Oh, you, you should have met our, our rhythm section at the time. You <laughs> I mean, yeah. it was terrifying. So um, I, I don't know if I'm speaking at a turn here, but, uh, one of the first nights we were in uh, <laughs> Belgium, my memory of this goes like this. <laughs> um, Jeff has his, Jeff has it together, right? So Jeff's never going to get in trouble. <clears throat> He's always going to be okay. Mm -hmm. He won't be okay. Like in, no, I mean, I'll be like, worried, but I'll be, I'll yeah, yeah, but whole, yeah. like physically he'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was a, I could go either way. I could either be a good boy or a bad boy. The rhythm section was always bad. Um, and the first night we're in Belgium, everybody speaks French, which is another learning thing. I, I, I sort of knew that they spoke Flemish, but it doesn't, Flemish is not really a thing to America. I mean, shit. I mean, to Americans, they barely know where anything is on the map, let alone <laughs> sure. what Belgians speak, you know, as a language. Right. And that's just the, the raw truth. Well, um, yeah, totally. So we're in Belgium <laughs> and, I, and I'm listening to these kids talk and I'm pretty sure they're speaking French, but I, I, I just, I don't know. I can't be sure. Anyway, we go up to sleep. 
Uh, Jeff goes up to sleep with the tour manager and the uh, the driver. I go up shortly after, after drinking a couple more drinks. And then we heard some commotion. Uh, <laughs> well, apparently on our first night of tour, a knife was pulled on our uh, drummer and bass player in a closed bar in the middle of Belgium because they uh, they were in negotiations over substances. And uh, uh, okay, so that, that was our that was our first night of tour. Oh my god! So that will let you know how touring with the Milwaukee's went back in the day. It was um, it was pretty crazy. Where we had people that we were supposed to stay with uh, calling the next people saying don't let them stay with you. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I'm not proud of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we did, I will say on, the, on, the, on the, the positive side, there are several positives too. First of all, wonderful stories. We've had, we have great stories. We could go we on for hours about that. Um, and in <laughs> retrospect, they're wonderful stories because most of us survived. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but um, the, we had... In terms of how we got around, the, the label hooked us up. Basically, the deal was um, the label paid a, a, paid for our backline for the whole time and got us a driver and a tour manager who were paid for for the whole thing. And so the, the driver was uh, a lovely guy named Paulo um, who w- was really into like, who would call it true metal. He would. He was really into true metal, and we'd have lots of conversations with him about what exactly that was. Yeah, what, um, what is true metal? Can you name I a true metal band? Know, I, I'm going to wait for Dylan to come back. He can do better on all his <laughs> true metal than I can. Okay. But he was he was lovely though. When we first met him, his his gums were bleeding. So we like get off the plane and like we meet this guy, and he seems really friendly, except he's got like blood all over his teeth. So that was a little <laughs> weird. Oh um, and his partner in crime was this woman, Martine, who I'm still in touch with, who was a total sweetheart. We called her tour mom. Um, I'm not sure that we all four would have survived and come back if it wasn't for, for Martine. Uh, she, she took care of us um, mm-hmm. and made sure we got where we needed to go. Um, and uh, so that was great. Um, and um and, and yeah, we had some we had some 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 low spots. There were uh, mm. <laughs> Martine had to find Brian, our drummer. He, she found him somewhere between the venue and the hotel in Germany, just passed out in an alley. She brought him back to the hotel. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> um, <laughs> so that was good. Um, he was asking what uh, oh, what Paula would list as as true metal. I, I deferred to you. I feel like you have that better than I do. I mean. It's pretty obvious, but like the first, <laughs> the first couple Metallica records. Okay, I just thought it was funny that he called it true metal. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, well, what considers a true? What's a true metal record? What yeah, you'll true. learn about Belgians is that they're very opinionated about <laughs> everything. Like Belgium is a weird place in that it's like in the middle of all these very like sort of culturally identifiable places, you know, like everybody knows what France is about and everybody mm-hmm. knows what Germany is about and everybody's stoned in, in, in Holland. And, you know, like it's like, <laughs> they all have their things and like Belgium is just sort of like lost in there. So like yeah. the Belgians, Belgians hate all of them uh, <laughs> for all of their character. And they're just all, it's all opinions. And uh, one of my favorite conversations I had with Paula was when I said, okay, Paula, I'm going to give you a choice. You can drive around. Um, you can drive around a Dutch band, uh, a German band, an English band, or an American. Or, or you know, I guess I think I just gave him those three because I assumed yeah. he was going to hate Americans because everybody hates Americans. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I didn't even put Americans on the table, and he thought about it for a second, and he's like, "Can I drive an American band?" And I'm like, "Are you serious?" <laughs> and he's like, "Yeah, well, the English are cheap, and the this and like I like I, he he wanted the American band, but but he did, really the truth is he didn't want any of them." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> nice. So you guys toured on the that record for you said four or five years. I mean, up until well, this yeah, is be, a stick up. Yeah, through this is a stick up. The, yeah, both, both UK, European tours were I think were in support of stick up. Okay. Yeah. And the next record you guys put out was American Anthems Volume One. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And tell me about uh, that getting from, you know, going from this is stick up to to that record. Well, the big thing about that was, I think the 
the biggest thing. I think at that point, it kind of broke to the point where the conversation that Jeff and I had was we were losing our old rhythm section. And then the conversation really was, are we going to be a different band? Are we going to call ourselves a different band? Or are we going to continue to be this same band? Um, because um, I didn't know how Jeff was feeling, but I didn't want to be, I wanted to do something different, totally different. And, um, and so Jeff just sort of said, well, let's get, uh, we'll get Pat and Chris, uh, these guys who were in another band. We got them. I mean, they were on the West Coast at that point. I think Chris was on the East Coast, but Pat was out in San Francisco. We got them uh, to come join our band. Um, and then our sound really just sort of stripped down a little bit to more of a rock, uh, just a basic, I don't want to say basic, but just a rock and roll sound. Um, mm-hmm. We were you know what's, in right, exploring right. that. Uh, so that's what, that, that was a big, it was a big shift in the sort of um, the sound of the band, which probably alienated some of the people that loved their band before. Um, but a lot of the people that loved our band um, hung on to, cert- like any other band, uh, mm-hmm. rolled with us. But sure. um, we definitely lost some people uh, when we shifted. You know, what was what was I think interesting was when first of all, like we weren't twenty one or twenty two anymore. Like we weren't just like uh, <laughs> our heads weren't on fire, mm-hmm. and and we also like when we changed the rhythm section. Um, we were, we, I think Dylan and I both felt like we suddenly realized (laughs) how many cycles, how much energy we were burning on simply surviving, like almost quite literally surviving with regard to touring. But it was just like all of our energy was going into keeping this crazy ship together. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that, I think that somewhere in there, like with our, spare energy and a little bit of maturity. I think that, (laughs) I think we discovered music a little bit in there too, you know, Mm -hmm. like, like we didn't have to play everything faster, harder, louder. Like we could be like, maybe, maybe dynamics are a thing, you know, like maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe actually like learning our instruments a little bit is a, like, is a thing. And uh, some of that, I think that, that definitely impacted, you know, we, we got really interested in not just like, ripping through a thing but but actually like crafting a thing um and that's i think a lot of the shift that that happened in in that era too yeah well you mentioned like maturing you know as a band and even as as humans i think like a lot of bands do that like you guys mentioned metallica earlier like the first metallica records are fast and metal and you know you get to the black album and it's a total it's the same band but there's just a different level of absolutely same band yeah. yeah, sort of. The and same I, I mean, it's, it's actually really like we sound nothing like Metallica, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's sort of like Hetfield's voice and there's like an approach to chords and melody that's that's similar there. But there's a lot of, you know, if you loved Metallica because like you, you loved like, you know, ripping people's faces off to it, like maybe, <laughs> sure. maybe you lose them <laughs> along the way. But at the end of the day, like it's still sort of like Hetfield's voice and that approach right. to stuff and and. What, I, I don't know, like what's to me been most interesting about where we're at right now is mm-hmm. with the current lineup and the current batch of like the stuff that we're about to release. Yeah, the, the new the record. record mm-hmm. It's, um, I we played last spring um, when live shows were still a thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping I'm saying that as a joke now and it'll be funny and like, six months well i did we'll, see a lot of bands but, are rescheduling their 2020 like everything that well, was happening this year is all yeah, now 2021 so oddly, <laughs> oddly we we decided to move in the opposite direction because we're like less competition like let's just jump on it but um <laughs> what i was going to say is last spring we played we played a, a 20th anniversary show mm-hmm. with the current lineup um and we played a set that blended 20 years worth of stuff um and it it was maybe the first time ever that I felt like it all felt natural in one night. Like both the the combination of musicians that we have right now are able to execute sort of all facets of it. And we've grown sort of 
comfortable with what was good about the various moments of that and able to just like get into that and deliver that song and then move to this. But it, it doesn't seem, as long as we pick carefully from 20 years worth of music, it doesn't seem disjointed to play all, all six all albums the records. In, yeah. in, in one night anymore. And I, I, I love that. Like I'm really psyched about that. Yeah, that's cool that you can still, you know, play albums that like Dylan wrote, you said, 22 years ago. I mean, yeah. and still yeah. make it make sense. That's that's pretty incredible. So you guys put out, and then like six years later, if I'm reading this correctly, you put out the second volume of American yeah. Anthems. And I think it was, I, I, I think it's Spotify, the, the, the interwebs has like the, the years a little screwy. It was, I think it was like, uh, yeah, it's a 2013. I'm looking at Spotify because yeah, no, I was be, able to should, find your whole catalog. There. I think it's 2011. Um, it's, oh, okay. It's, yeah, it's it's like uh, yeah, 2007 and then 2011, if I'm remembering correctly, something like that. Yeah, yeah. But okay. most of the thought... songs were done at at once. Like we, most of the recordings were done in 2009 or whatever, seven, whatever. Seven. It was. Oh, yeah. so well. I, I think we had about we had we had two records worth done when we released mm-hmm. volume one. Okay. And then we we I think we threw out a handful that we thought were going to be on volume two and we replaced them with new stuff. Know, probably yeah, there's probably, probably four, four or five. Yeah. Four, four or five yeah, new ones, yeah. Um that uh, so yeah, I think that we we had a version of volume two immediately that we weren't super psyched about. And then we sat on it for a little while and we wrote some more and then finally mixed the stuff from the same session with some new stuff to ultimately end up at volume two. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And do you feel like, vol- it, I mean, obviously it's, it's volume two. Is it kind of cohesive to what you guys did in the first, at first volume or no? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I personally think that that volume two American anthems is probably the best thing that we had done since you know, maybe mystical command at that point um, yeah. for us personally. Yeah. I just felt like we were in a good stride. We we're in a good place. Um, the songs were good. Uh, we were kind of like still having fun, but focused. And it, it's really all about the songs and the batch of songs that you have. And uh, at that point, I really thought that the, the album was strong. So I, I think we were all really happy with that. Um, mm-hmm. Not that we were happy with volume one because i think a yeah. lot of people were we got we gained a lot of new fans with volume yeah, one yeah, yeah. Totally. Uh, but volume two i think maybe brought some of the older fans that that weren't digging some of the other stuff who knows i mean uh, I, you never quite know when you're the person in the you know who's uh who's performing it right uh, but uh but yeah so that that that's the uh, volume two was i think uh one of our shining moments as a band yeah I, I feel like I feel like in volume one, we were it was almost like we were trying on some clothes um, to see if they fit. And by volume two, we figured out which from that bit fit, and we could sort of walk around really wearing it right, you know. Sure. Uh, yeah. Like I, I think we were experimenting with like the softer, more like rootsy Americana like edges of things, and we were kind of like trying to find where our edge was, like where how far we could go before it was like. We were sort of fumbling there, sure. you know, and I think that we 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 learned those lessons on volume one, and we sort of applied them better by the time volume two was done. Okay, and with volume two, you said that you know that things kind of changed for you guys with volume two, as far as the band goes. You said you're attracting more fans and stuff. Was that were you guys signed to a record label or, at all at that point? Were you getting bigger tours? No. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't about tours. It, I think it was more about like the songs. I think um, yeah. I could sort of see from the people that would come out to our shows, I could sort of see the reaction to certain songs where um, I know these people that came to our shows for, you know, whatever it was, the last 10 years at that point. And mm-hmm. I know what their favorite songs were. And so when we were playing one of the new songs, and I could see them really enjoying it. Uh, that meant a lot to me, I know, uh, mm-hmm. because, um, you know, this is where I was going. This is where we were going as a band. And it's not always going to be the same album over and over again, you know. Sure. With us, I mean, we always 
want to change it. We're one of those bands. Uh, whether it sounds like it or not, we don't intend to make the same record over and over again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. that's why Volume 2 was called Volume 2 because we felt, well, this is very much like the first American anthem, so let's just make it a double thing. Whereas like the new record is, uh, uh, I think, a departure from that. Um, yeah. And that's, that's what we're always intending to do. Mm-hmm. And was, so you got... There- Sorry, go ahead. Uh, or there was, um, I think, in terms of, <laughs> we, we got on some different, like, first of all, we've, we basically, with the exception of the little bit of foreign label support, we've basically done it ourselves mm-hmm. almost 100%, um, partially because we're really stubborn, partially because we've never been particularly driven to be famous. Like we're pretty satisfied by writing great songs, making good records and like playing shows. And like, Mm -hmm. if that's what drives you, like you can do that on your own, you know, like when, when, when you start assessing your success based on how much bigger the audience is this month than it was last month. And am I, you know, am I succeeding because, based on how many, you know, people seem to, uh, you know, praise you. Like that, that's never been our bag really. And as mm-hmm. a result, we've never sort of like fished for that, that, the, the, you know, grab for that ring. Um, mm-hmm. and also we're just really sort of stubborn and self-directed and we don't want anybody telling us what to do or anything like that. So, so, um, anyway, but, but, we did get some opportunities where things got on like um, different like iTunes playlists, comps and things like that, that, that mm-hmm. sort of like had a weird viral thing. We were like, uh, one of our songs got on a, some sort of guitar center playlist that got like a hundred thousand downloads just like randomly, uh, you wow. know, and, and that, and that cool. like, so like then we got, it's the same way that actually we were missile command sort of caught the, caught the, a little bit of the wave, it might've even been the tail end of the wave of Napster, but like a uh, lot of our early tours were booked on like somebody downloaded somebody's entire catalog that also had Jimmy Eat World on it. And they found like something from Missile Command and like they would literally just email me and be like, you wanna come play in Macomb, Illinois? And we're like, yes. <laughs> and they, they found it just because like people were pirating music. Right, um, wow. And and, and then we, we, we kind of caught a weird second wave of that, like mm-hmm. the, but but more of the, less of the, you know, pirated version and more of like when businesses figured out how to <laughs> do that officially or whatever. Mm-hmm. Some of that happened and that I think exposed us to different audiences and things through streaming services, just mm-hmm. like being on shared places. Nice, that's, oh, that's cool. So how'd you guys get hooked up with Raby? Um, Ray B, Ray came through, uh, he was a recommendation of Tom Bojour who produced our, our, our new record. Um, oh, okay. So are, yeah. is that a pretty new relationship with you guys? Yeah. Ray yeah. Very, very new, but, okay. but yet feels old because I mean, he's the guy from Weehawken, New Jersey. We're a Jersey mm-hmm. city band. Like I, I would be shocked if we hadn't been in a room with him multiple times over without knowing it. I don't know that I've ever said hello to him and shook his hand, but like the first time I talked to him, I was like, okay, like I know, I know who this guy is. You know, like it, it right. just, he's sort of part of the family and the scene and whatever. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, he's so, great. I love him. <laughs> yeah. I was I mean, he, curious. Yeah. How you I felt, I felt because I've basically done all of our working of our records to date, at least in the U S and when I first started talking to him, I, I was like, you know, there's guys like Jim Testa at Jersey Beat has been a long time, big time supporter of us. Um, and I mean, bless it. Uh, and I was like, I sort of was like talking to Ray. I'm like, Ray, I, I'm, I'm a little afraid. It, like, I don't want, like, just don't, let me call Jim first and tell him that somebody other than me is going to talk to you about us and that it's not because... Like we think we're too cool. It's just because we need help organizing things. <laughs> uh, so I, so I, I, he's like, yeah, dude, I, I know, like, I, I would see Jim when I'm out walking my dog at Weehawken. Like we're neighbors. We're all, but like, don't worry about Jim. But I still felt the need to call up Jim, and I'm like, Jim, look, man, somebody other than me is going to send you a record. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> I made like three or four of those calls to people around New Jersey. Uh, just, just, just because like I, it's been us for so long that I, right. I felt weird, like as if suddenly we had people or something. It's not, it's not how we roll. Yeah, but that's still rad to get. I mean, I, they represent a lot of really, yeah, yeah. really big and really rad artists. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's cool to For be sure. a part of that. Yeah. So yeah. tell me about the new record. You, the last album you guys put out was uh, American Anthems Volume Two, and you you said Spotify's wrong. So uh, that was what? like so it's like, been nine. We were just realized the other years. day it's been yeah almost ten years. Wow. So we tell had me children. About that. Like oh, okay, so there's yeah. other other things happened in life. Yeah. Life happened. Is that kind of yes? What, like that's, I mean, that's that's most of the story, right? I was yeah. wondering, like, were you guys still active and just kind of yeah. just playing those other yeah, songs I mean, for a long time? Basically, my daughter is eleven. Uh, okay, I, I have a son that's eight, but my daughter's eleven. At that point, it was a shift, I think, in 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 my thinking. Uh, sure. With everything, and we were all still kind of in and around your city. I think. Probably three of the four of us lived within a stone's throw. We'd hang out all the time. Um, it it changed me. It, it it sort of like shifted my focus. Um, but at the, simultaneously, I think uh, I wrote a lot of songs uh, at that point that I think have kind of since gone away. Yeah. Um, but so. I was still writing a lot. We were still rehearsing, playing shows. Uh, but then I think the big thing that happened was we decided at one point, my brain, uh, when I was younger, I always used to write songs no matter what. It was the only thing I really thought about. I think once I had kids, it sort of shifted my brain. Like I, I thought about maybe being a parent more than I thought about writing songs. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was it was tough for my brain to really occupy the songwriting space all the time. And uh, one of the cool things was, at some point, I guess maybe in two thousand and that's probably five years ago, probably fifteen, or maybe earlier. Um, I just sort of made a conscious decision. All right, it's time for a new record, and uh, I really kind of hunkered down and started writing new songs and uh i had gotten a new piano i had moved out of jersey city mm -hmm. uh moved into the suburbs um and uh i, I got a upright and i started playing with that a lot and wrote a lot of songs and then i think from there uh we were really kind of had good momentum going did some demos and then pat moved to san diego uh, oh, that's that was, where I live. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. That's where I want to live. Uh, so that so yeah, so Pat moved to San Diego. And so then we were in another conundrum. We had uh eight, nine songs demoed for the new record, and this is probably around 15. And we had no drummer. So then it was find a drummer. And we're not like, find a drummer, record with a drummer, it's all going to be good. We're like, you know, have to find a drummer that's going to be good, have to rehearse for years and years. <laughs> and so that's what we did. And wow. uh, then you were, we emerged on the other side of it, it's probably like 2017, mm -hmm. and then get our act together and finish up the rest of the record. Um, you know, as the crow flies, it probably took us as much as any other record. Probably, probably about, <laughs> took us about two and a half weeks. <laughs> but, but with our life and with, with what has gone on when you're somebody who's not getting paid to do this um it took a it, it took a long time but yeah. we've huh. been, we've we've been we've been thinking about this since i think probably 2000 and probably six years ago it just took yeah. that long and jeff had twins and you know yeah. we've had we've had listen we've had deaths in the family we've had cancer we've had we i mean we've had all we've yeah we've run the absolute gamut of life through the band and mm -hmm. that's why it took that that long yeah hey, that makes uh, sense yeah a, a couple things in addition to that one is i would say that 
we probably threw out as many songs. Like if we had recorded every song we wrote through there, we probably would have ended up with another volume one and volume two. We definitely threw out like half of the things that we wrote since, since the last record. For sure. Um, and <laughs> the other, the other joke is that Tom Pochure, who, who produced the record, he he's convinced it's cursed because like <laughs> during the recording, um, I broke my wrist. Oh my I gosh. A, I got a concussion. Tom had, I think what he calls a, a minor stroke, like literally had a stroke. Oh my um, goodness. I have since I've broken my, my other arm here before it's released. So like, I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm broken right now. I mean, there was a pandemic, um, you know, whatever, all kinds of, there was, there was a lot of weird stuff that happened, but, but yeah. And, and including, including, births and deaths and the whole bit so sure. so it's 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 been a journey yeah well, it was funny you, got- you know like like on the uh, <laughs> there was a couple of i don't know a couple of months ago when we finally really finished and got everything mixed before it was mastered mm-hmm. and it took like usually in the past we had we kind of like blocked out a couple of weeks we're gonna hunker down or, you know we would we would write and rehearse till everything was tight 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 for like you know, two years or whatever it was. And then we do in two weeks, we'd finish a record. Mm -hmm. Um, This did not go like that. We recorded half of it with Pat, like when he came back to visit, because we hadn't landed somebody yet. We wanted to capture the songs. And then we we wrote a whole new batch and and recorded the second half with our new drummer, Austin. Um, Where was I going with this? Oh, but the the point is that even the the basic tracks happened over the course of a couple of years because of circumstances. Mm-hmm. And I had, on all previous records, I had, like, I knew what the script was. I, like, I knew what the arc of the story was. And I sort of, like, wasn't seeing it on this until it was all done. And then I listened back to all the mixes in a row and we started to sequence it. And I, and I sent Dylan a text. I'm like, holy shit, I think we made it. Like, this is actually, this is actually, this is a good record. Like, it actually does make sense. I, I was afraid it was going to sound all scattered, but... Once I had a moment to have some distance, I was like, oh no, this is, this is really good. This is like a whole unit. It makes sense. That's awesome. Yeah. And the new record's called The Calling. Yes. And it's coming out uh, in August, but you have a single coming out yeah. to, uh, on the 26th, yes. which is in a couple of weeks from today. So yeah. tell me about uh, No Way Out and why was that the, the first sing- song you guys decided to release, you know, in nine years? Why was that? The yeah. Way? <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, again, like anything else, it's just um, by accident. Uh, we, you know, I writing a bunch of songs for the new record. This one particularly came in. It was, um, I knew it was very uh, poppy, very sugary sounding. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I resisted that at first. I didn't, I didn't really, I don't know. I wasn't feeling it. Um, and I think that unusually, cause I have a pretty sugary ear for music. I, I, I don't really like metal. Like we were talking about before. I like <laughs> pop music. Like I love like bands like, uh, you know, teenage fan club and you know, the Beatles and that the Matthew sweet, that's what I grew up on, you know, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, but this particular song I was, uh, I think, uh, Jeff and the guys were really kind of convincing me that it was uh, one of the good ones. Uh, and I think at, at a certain point I was like, you know, that song is just garbage. You know, I just didn't, <laughs> I just didn't believe in it. You know, at the time I just thought it was maybe just, um, uh, I don't know. I just, I, I just didn't think it represented what I wanted to represent. Uh, and then somewhere along the, along the way, um, I think my ego got stroked by enough people that told me it was good. I just started believing it was good. And then, uh, and then from there, no, I mean, it was kind of unanimous. We played it out and a bunch of my friends who are huge music snobs, I mean, huge, huge music snobs that do not accept that you play a wrong song at a barbecue of mine and my friends will fist fight you. And, uh, (laughs) and they were like, Hey man, that, uh, that new song, that, that No Way Out song, that, that's probably one of the best songs you got. And I was like, really? That song? You know? So I think that happened enough time 
and with Jeff and the other guys going, yeah, this is, this is it. I think I, I finally acquiesced and said, uh, well, I guess I'm just going to have to be wrong about this one and, uh, let it go. And to this day, anybody, I, you know, people that I play it for just, uh, seem to be very happy to listen to it. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's it. And, and I think now I finally, I can finally appreciate it, which is weird because I don't know why I, like I've written so many poppy songs. I don't know why this one I couldn't accept, but uh, I accept it and uh, I'm happy with it. <laughs> really, cool. I, it, what's what's fascinating to me about it is like I don't remember. I it may be that the only reason I lobbied you so hard for it is for none of the reasons I told you. Um, and yeah. you'll get a scoop on this one on the podcast. But like he wrote the best guitar lick ever on the piano, and he just came in with the the like the lick, the guitar lick on the piano. And I was playing like rhythm guitar to it. And I was like, okay, I just need to go about finding out how to get him back on the guitar over here <laughs> so I can play that part. And <laughs> convincing the song is great, so I just get to play that lick. That's what I know about this song. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <Yeah. laughs> That's cool. So you, you write a lot, of this, a lot on the piano then. Uh, well, no, I never really did. I always wrote everything on acoustic guitar. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, this album was the first time I just stepped up, and um, I like to. I, I play in a lot of open tunings. Uh, I, I play, uh, and when that kind of runs out of tricking my brain and writing melodies, I go to capos. I always try something different. Mm -hmm. This was the first time I went to the piano as something to, um, you know, I. I I really think unless you're a songwriting wizard, uh, most songwriters uh, uh, have a tendency to write the same kind of thing. And not in a mm -hmm. bad way. They just have a, have a tendency to write the same kind of melodies. Yeah, uh, it's like a style. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they're just drawn to the chords that they want to play. And I know certain chords give me a feeling that I cannot get away from. I just, I just can't. I, I can... I can listen to a, a song from the Love and Spoonful, and if I play those <laughs> chords, it does not inspire me to write a melody. It's a, I'm not shitting on the Love and Spoonful. I think they're a great <laughs> band. I just don't. I just don't get it. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't get it for my own songs. Uh, so um, yeah. So what I have to do sometimes is just go on another instrument or or try something different. So this album was a lot of piano. Um, in the end, it's the same chords, it's the same shit, but it tricked my brain into thinking that it was something magical, which I think that's what songwriting is. I, for me, it's always been this sort of like weird magical place that uh, I can get to where uh, a song kind of comes out of nowhere. And, um, and sometimes as a writer, it's hard to get there. Sometimes you get stuck. Um, I think I'm currently stuck uh although i i during this whole time being isolated i had a, like a little we had a little family crisis in the last month but uh the first month of it i was really kind of inspired because i kind of just sat with myself and decided well i'm going to write every day so mm -hmm. um so you know songwriting has always been uh something that I've, I've always been very thankful i can do and uh i'm thankful i got that piano and uh, I can write now on the piano. So, yeah, I would I would suggest to any person trying to write songs or anybody out there, just always try something different. You know, it could it could knock. Uh, you know, you, you wind up doing the same thing, but um, it just it, it can trick you into thinking that that you're onto something. Mm -hmm. What's What's funny for me is like the the side man to his different experiments and tricks is that like. And I'm not like a music theory guy. I, I know a little bit. Uh, I think I think Dylan stays blissfully unaware so as to like summon the magic. But like, so he'll he'll you know tune his guitar to something weird, or he'll throw a capo into a weird spot, or even play a piano. And I've like I I know I know the things that sound good to his ear. Like I know that like the 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 dude doesn't like to play a third in his chord. Like he always will find a way. It doesn't matter what instrument it is. Like he, you know, unschooled in piano, but like we'll sit down and we'll find a way to suspend a fourth in a thing because that's the thing that always inspires him to the melody. And like he can tune a guitar funny. He can throw a capo on, he can play a piano, but it's, there's always, there's like when, when I, cause 
I, one of the things I try to do, like, first of all, I, I really don't like two guitar bands that just have two guitar players doing the same thing. I'm like, why are you doing that? So yeah. one of the things I'm lucky for with him always needing to like sort of do something different to keep himself inspired is like, he's always got his guitar in a weird tuning or a capo or something. So if I just never change the tuning on my guitar, like I'll always be playing something different, you know? So, <laughs> so um, but as doing that, like he'll bring in the piano song and I'll be like, Oh yeah. It's like, I, this is, this, this is how Dylan writes songs. Like I see the DNA all over it and it's cool to like watch the excitement in his eye, you know, because he's, uh-huh. he's sort of put himself into the magic spot. But then it's, it's something about like just somebody's fingerprint on the music. Like he's got a, a musical fingerprint that it doesn't, I mean, you know, you put him in front of a tuba for a little while, like he's, he's still not going to play it a third in there. Like, I know he's still going to play the four <laughs> instead. Like, I like, you know, like I just, <laughs> but that's cool. You know, like okay. that's, that's, and that's, you know, the funny thing we were talking before, is it the same band? Is it a different band somewhere in that midpoint, you know, like that, that trick was the same all the way through. Like, like his sensibility, like what the, how chords or notes interact with melodies to inspire a, a complete song. Like, there's something that's the same throughout it if you like were to just chart it all on paper. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so you, I, I mean, that's, this must, must be really exciting to have a record coming out, you know, the first one in a long time, but is it weird that it's going to be put out, like especially this new single and stuff where you can't support it as far as like touring goes? I, I oh. think if, if being fully honest with kids, like, it would be hard for us to muster a multi-day, let alone multi-week tour now anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm going to spoil it immediately, but there was, I didn't, it, I'd be lying if I didn't say I had the thought of like, I mean, we don't have to make excuses for it because no one's touring. <laughs> like, <it was> just, <laughs> but, you know, it, it, I don't know. It's, it's weird. Like, even just in the last week or two, as news started to come out about it coming, I got a lot of emails and feedback online from folks that I hadn't heard from in a long time who were like, oh, finally something good is going to happen. Like, so there's something I'm looking forward to for the first time in a while. And mm-hmm. like, yeah, if we fill a little bit of a void for, for, for people, because there's a lot, I mean, a, a lot of any acts with any real muscle behind them, the muscle has moved them to 2021, mm-hmm. you know? Right. Like, if we can be the ones that, that because we're either – too stupid or too stubborn to get any help that uh, are also too stupid or too stubborn to, to not move our record and provide some people some, some relief and something different. Like, sure. That's cool. And truth be told, if there's a real show to play in Lawrence, Kansas in September, we'll fucking play it. (laughs) That is like, I mean, that's the real truth. Like if you're like, Hey man, uh, you know, we just sold, you know, 250 tickets in law. Like we're there. We'll yeah. drive there and we'll play the show. Yeah. And uh, the Milwaukee's way to do that will literally be to just drive there, play that show, and we will drive home and be back for our responsibility. Like, that is, <laughs> that, I mean, like, I'm not kidding. The drives we've made, we've driven, the, the time we got kicked out of Canada, we drove from the border of, of Canada, right on the border of, like, North Dakota and Montana. I know. From there, Minot. yeah, but basically Minot to... New Jersey. We did that drive once. Um, we did forty hours. The, forty yeah. hours. Uh, that was like there. I think that was we like thirty six or thirty seven. Whatever. I mean, okay, that's splitting fine. hairs. We, but we made one stop. We stopped. <laughs> we stopped at a Perkins in Madison after a Badgers know, football it, game. Yeah, it was a Badgers <laughs> football game. That. that. <laughs> and yeah. we um and and we did we we did we wrapped up a West Coast tour by driving from um, Reno to New Jersey straight. <laughs> do you guys know. just take shifts like driving yes. and like so it's just we're constant we, it's like truck no, driving where yes, you're just nobody, constantly going <laughs> nobody yes. in the band especially at that point did Ugh. cocaine or speed so we did it all <laughs> well, natural we were no, not, it was at like, that point it was all like, natural yeah we're like major league ball players no yeah. steroids on board <laughs> Right. I get, I mean, Just even coffee. when I, that's it. Well, no, you know what the trick is? The trick, I, my trick Some was point. always, um, was always, was always like a jalapeno, um, uh, flavored sesame, uh, not sesame seeds, uh, sunflower seeds. Oh, okay. Because like, it's kind of a job, 
but the spice will keep you awake and you kind of just like I, I had a I mean, like I had two jobs to do. I had to finish that bag of spicy uh, <laughs> seeds, <Some RC. laughs> and I had to drive across like Nebraska. Yeah, yeah. Like I, and, and that's like that's another thing that's just in in our DNA. And I don't know if it's a New a New Jersey thing or an adopted New Jersey thing for me, or it's a little bit of like a, we we have long joked about like the, the sort of Catholic DNA in this band is also an interesting factor. Mm-hmm. We're like we don't really think that comfort is something that's right, but for <laughs> us. <laughs> it's not, you know, like, like, no, it's like, no, no, no. We, we're playing shows. We're in a band. We have a job to do. We need, we need to get across Kansas and we're just going to dr- Like, we're not going to yeah. stop. <laughs> we're not going to take a little break. Like yeah, we yeah. are going to just put our nose down and we're going to go. And we're going to play for the kids wherever they are. <laughs> and then we're going to turn around and come home as uncomfortable as it might be. Yeah. Oh and if you have God. to sleep, you can sleep in a basement that's filled with snakes on the floor. Yeah, if you had to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you had to. Oh, man. So. That's cool. I mean, that's that's a positive way to look at it as far as, like, the touring and situation goes and, and, <laughs> and, and putting the record out. I mean, at yeah. least people will have a chance to really digest it while, while yeah. we're all kind of still stuck inside. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you guys, like, while in quarantine, have you been able to, like, are you writing together at all or... Like, have you gone live on like the Facebook things or Instagram or any of that stuff to perform or? No, um, not really. We haven't really. I mean, me and Jeff, we Facetime one time. I've been, I've been writing on. You know, I read a lot of songs on my own, so mm-hmm. I've been uh, trying to write. But um, I was, um, I was early on before I broke the arm. I was. Oh yeah, I forgot you had a broken arm. Well, I was a couple of weeks, and it was actually probably two months into the quarantine before I broke my arm. But um, I was threatening Dylan to with uh, to drop a, a USB mic off at his house as I was making acoustic demos of like hair metal arrangements <laughs> of like songs. So I have teed up for him. Should he ever feel ambitious, I have iPad Garage Band multi tracks of both. Uh, what is it? Hysteria? Is that what I have? Yep. Hysteria and uh, Mr. Big's uh, To Be With You. So like someday I might get him to put, to lay vocals on that or the internet can have that. I would uh, love to. That would, that, that, that was, that was an er- like when we thought it was just going to be like a couple of weeks, I was like, ah, oh, this will be funny. And then it was like a couple of months that I broke my arm. So that didn't <laughs> work out. So Before that I was, I was actually really working on like, I was working on, like trying to learn how to play slide guitar because like I'm terrible at it. It just fascinates me. Mm -hmm. So I I was trying to like, just put some extra tricks in my, in, in my, in my bag. Yeah. Yeah. I I think the, the, I think the quarantine had good steam in the beginning. And then after, like after two months, everybody, like, I think I, I just lost my shit about it. So I was like, you know, yeah, it's getting pretty old, right? Yeah. (laughs) It it, it lost its momentum. It lost its like novelty, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it was it, 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 yeah. for me. It shifted from like I'm feeling inspired to like I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know if I'm ever gonna get out of here. You know what I mean? Sure, so, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's 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 a, that's the situation everybody's in. So I I can't complain. <laughs> yeah, it's been a yeah. it's been quite the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for uh, sure. Well, I can't. I mean, I'm super excited for you guys. This new record to come out. That's awesome. I can't wait. I, I've I've heard the new song. Um, Ray sent it to me, so I love it. I think it's awesome, and I can't wait for cool. everybody else to experience it here in cool. what, like a week and a half or so. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I really appreciate your your guys' time sitting and chatting with me uh, yeah, this evening. Thank I appreciate you. it. Yeah. yeah. Happy um, to do it. I have one more question for you guys. Uh, I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Um, Jeff, do you want to go first? Or? <laughs> um, uh, I, yes. Um, go, leave home and go play in front of people you don't know. Um, you'll learn more from playing in uncomfortable situations um, and having to figure out how to succeed there than you will from maybe maybe anything else. And frankly, like if you can't stomach 
the struggle to succeed and frequently fail in front of people that you don't know, like you're going to, it's going to be hard for you to do anything great anyway, because like do making, making things that are worth making, you sort of have to swallow your, your fear a little bit. And there's no better way to get used to doing that, that than like just putting yourself in uncomfortable situations and having to, to prove it and believe what you've done and sell it and all of that. That's that. Mm-hmm. I like it. Yeah. And, and, and my thing would just be um, everything Jeff just said. Plus um, I started this when I was young. I started this with my friends. Uh, I felt mm. it was a very organic thing. Uh, my thing is just find people that, you know, you guys, y- y'all love music and it means a lot to you and just play together and see what happens. And d- again, this, this is uh, this is an old man comment and I'm an old man, <laughs> but don't let like chicks or drugs get in the middle of your shit. <laughs> and, and I mean that, and I mean that, listen, listen, this could be, you could have chicks in your band and chicks come in the middle of your band. That's not what this is about. This is about like, just, just your goal is is your and don't get don't get messed up on drugs i think mr dave Grohl had said just don't do cocaine and i think that's pretty much good for me (laughs) 